Yeah. Okay, y'all, we are up and running. So I just want to start by welcoming everyone. Thanks so much for joining us tonight. My name is Liberty, and I'm a member of the Firestorm Collective. We're excited to host this discussion um, about the abolition of adult supremacy with contributors uh, from a, a new book, Trust Kids, uh, Stories on Youth Autonomy and Confronting Adult Supremacy from AK Press. If you haven't picked it up yet, you really should. Uh, everyone kept saying that it's a book that's going to make you cry. And I was like, it's not going to make me cry. And then I got like 10 pages into it and was choking up. So <laughs> there you go. Um, Firestorm, uh, our collective is a 14-year-old um, radical bookstore owned and operated by a queer feminist collective in Southern Appalachia. Um, we operate on the land of the Cherokee people. We strive to feature books uh, and host events that reflect our interests and the needs of marginalized communities in the South. We're also continuing to do events like this one um, online, both because we really like reaching people at a distance and across borders, uh, but also because COVID we know is continuing to create barriers for many people in our community. Over the course of this month, we'll be doing a couple more events uh, to wrap up the year. Um, those include events on the role of violence and nonviolence in our movements um, and mentorships for incarcerated writers. So if those sound like interesting topics to you, uh, definitely consider signing up for those events. Um, follow us on social media and I'll drop a link to our calendar um, in the chat. So please note that tonight we are using Zoom's Q&A tool. Uh, if you have any questions throughout the evening, I would encourage you to just go ahead and write those questions out. Um, you can find the tool in Zoom kind of like located at the bottom of the screen. Or if you're not on Zoom, but you're like watching this as a stream, like on Facebook, um, you can simply use the comment section there. Okay, great. So we're going to get started. I'm going to do a few introductions. Uh, tonight, we are joined by Trust Kids editor Carla Joy Bergman and Noliga Radway, Stacey Patton, Toby Rollo, and Zach Bergman. Carla is a joy archist who dabbles with poetry, writing, and storytelling, often uh, opening realms of autonomy, art, creativity, and challenging empire. Carla has spent the last two decades creating intergenerational multimedia projects with communities that are rooted in trust, and with youth autonomy and undoing adult supremacy at the heart of all she does. Nolika Radway is the founder of Queer Media, a family production company specializing in audio and visual art through a Black queer lens. She's the producer and host of the progressive parenting podcast, Raising Rebels. I'll drop a link. Uh, she's also the former executive director of the Brooklyn Free School. Stacy Patton is a child abuse survivor and former foster uh, youth turned an award-winning journalist, college professor, and child advocate. She's the author of That Mean Old Yesterday, Spare the Kids, Why Whooping Children Won't Save Black America, and the forthcoming Strung Up, The Lynching of Black Children in Jim Crow America. Toby Rollo is an associate professor of political science at Lakehead University. His research interests uh, focus on democratic theory, the history of political thought, disability, and childhood. He has published on the intersections of childhood and race, colonialism, feminism, and contemporary democratic politics. Last but not least, Zach Bergman is an artist, writer, record label owner, and a composer. He holds an MA in electroacoustics and composition from the University of Birmingham. You can find Zach's music under the moniker Sour Gout um, and Collapse Structures. Uh, so welcome everyone. I'm gonna go ahead and pass off to Carla, but I am just immensely <laughs> pleased to be here with you tonight. Hello everyone. Um, thank you, Liberty. Thanks everyone. Um, just everyone who's showing up and being here. It's it's uh, so humbling and um, I'm, and we're all so grateful that you're here. Uh, it's just, thank you. Um, thanks to everyone at Firestorm, the, the whole events and the process leading up to it's been really um, generative and supportive and I really appreciate it. Um, 
And um, I'm, Zach and I are calling in from the land of the Musqueam, uh, Squamish and Tsleil-Waututh peoples, also known as Vancouver, Canada. Um, and I get a little nervous, so I do have notes, so bear with me. <laughs> I'm gonna try to keep this uh, sort of intro under around five minutes so, because everyone here is so incredible. And I want you all to have time to hear from these brilliant people. Um, I just quickly wanna give a shout out to AK Press um, for supporting me in this work all along the way, uh, especially Zach Blue, um, thank you so much. Um, and, uh, just lots of love and gratitude to uh, my family, Uliam, Zach, and Chris, and my dear friends, um, Lily, uh, Chris Time, and Kitty, who have really um, supported me with this event in lots of unforeseen and beautiful ways. Um, and I just want to thank everyone who contributed to the book, like in black and white, inside the actual book, but also everyone beyond, like across generations, across all time. Um, there's we're sitting with so many people. Um, and I just wanna acknowledge that and invite them here um, and all of you. Um, but most of all, thank you to Nolika, who's calling in from <laughs> in the middle of the night in Europe. Thanks for being here. Thank you, Stacy, so much for being here. And thank you, Toby, so much for being here. And of course, thank you, Zach, <laughs> for being uh, next yeah. to me and supporting me. Um, yeah. I. I, before I get started on kind of framing the book, I want to um, talk about why this talk is uh, has um, five adults on it, on the panel, because I've heard through the grapevine that this is a comment that gets posted on social media. Um, I want to say I'm always learning. I, I did invite my uh, team to be sit here next to me. He also wrote for the book in the book. And he said, are you kidding me? I am not going to be the tokenized youth on a panel with a bunch of adults talking about abolishing uh, adult supremacy because it is an adult problem and it is up to you guys to figure this out. Um, if you wanna do a, pod, a thing on uh, autonomy and youth, I'm there. <laughs> so uh, just wanted to give that framework because I think it's important. Um, okay, welcome to the talk about trust kids abolishing adults supremacy. <laughs> um, Trust Kids is a book about relationships and love, first and foremost. And it is, and in it is some of the stories, but there are so many more. Um, and to me, trust feels best when the conditions are set up to allow for it. Uh, so adult supremacy is the thing that prevents trust from flowing in relationships between kids and adults. Trust is always a risk, but it's always worth it and foundational to the thriving community, including in our homes. Uh, because to me, solidarity begins at home. Why I center solidarity and autonomy um, is because adults, all of us, cannot liberate young people. No group that has power over or is oppressing another group can liberate them. But we can be in solidarity with young people. We can help co-create spaces and places for them to thrive more and to have experience more autonomy and maybe work together for intergenerational thriving. Um, the book aims to amplify stories and actions that reveal the liberatory potential of undoing these social borders that cut us off from each other and the world. Therefore, for youth autonomy and collective liberation to take hold, adults must also contend with their personal and social power while they actively work to undo adult supremacy. This social constructed and often violent social border between adults and kids is a massive barrier to youth and kids autonomy and intergenerational thriving. Unbuilding these walls will take a fierce commitment from us all. Because as long as there are seeds of hierarchy in any of our relationships, justice will not uh, take root and it definitely won't bloom. So I aim to do a couple things with this book. One is to disrupt the notion that school is the central part of children's lives or that the oppression of children hinges only on schooling. Instead, I wanted to take a step back and come and start at home. It's our most private place because children cannot live alone Power and privilege are at play there always, even in the most radical homes. This is an issue. This is happening. Um, 
sorry, I lost my voice. <laughs> yeah, and the second thing I did was I, I actively invited in folks who aren't parents and or don't work with children because um, it was important to think about all the ways that adults interact with young people out in the world, including school, but also just anywhere to talk about adult supremacy. Um, and I also did it because we've all been kids. And perhaps it's a more generative place to start this conversation from. It's an invitation to us all. And I'm not collapsing us into sameness here. Not at all. This isn't a liberal call to all get along. But it's rather highlighting this alongside the uneven and, and um, just the, you know the unfair world. Because again, I'm going to say it again, <laughs> confronting adult supremacy needs more adults doing the work. It kind of needs us all, actually. Um, and this is my last little bit, uh, tuning, tuning into the horrors of adult supremacy and seeing it everywhere can sometimes be a lonely, lonely road. And I, and I mean this, like, this is why I have a lot of grief around this work a bit. Um, there's a lot of loss. There are a lot of adults can't hold it with you. They leave relationships go away. Um, and so as while I'm, you know, I'm just so blown away and so grateful for all the activists and organizers and everyone who's showing up and talking about this conversation and doing the work to undo adult supremacy. I, I have these mixed feelings going at play. Um, I faced a lot of vitriol over the years when I bring this conversation up in, in any organizing space. Um, so it's it's got a long history. Um, uh, along so with that, I invite you all, everybody, even if you've been on this road, or if you're new to it, to walk with us, to walk with the slowest a la Zapatistas, to walk with tenderness and fierce love, and then together, let's abolish uh, adult supremacy. And that's my introduction and framework. Um, I'm now going to... Uh, I have uh, some prompts for each of the panelists. And uh, first up, Nolika, hi. <laughs> Thank <you> hello, for... <laughs> hello. <laughs> Thank you for being here. Um, I'm so excited to share the space with you. I could say more, but I'm, I want you to say more. Um, mm -hmm. So <laughs> please respond to the powerful Bell Hooks quote, uh, which I used in my introduction. Children need to be raised in loving environments. Whenever domination is present, love is lacking. And perhaps can you talk about the role of vulnerability in undoing the social borders between kids and youth? Um, I want <laughs> and whatever else you want to talk about. <laughs> yeah, I can talk about all of the things. Um, I want to just like, yeah, I'm feeling as you were sharing, you know, your intro and talking about all of the things, like. It was making really emotional. Like I feel myself, um, I feel myself like I couldn't, I wanted to read my piece before I could like, just to like refresh it. And I, every time I went to go read it, I was like, I couldn't, like, it was just, I don't know, tender still. Um, and I have, I think about love a lot when I'm thinking about this conversation in my relationship with my children in a very purposeful way. And I think often with love, there's this way of like, of course, parents love their children. You know what I mean? Like just, we all love, you know, of course, parents love their children. And um, we don't often like define what this, what, what exactly do we mean by that? And um, I, so many people have kind of rediscovering bell hooks is bell hooks in general but um all about love and specifically and in that book where she defines love as the willingness to expand um for the emotional growth of someone else and yourself it was like a light bulb when i read that I, like a light bulb went off and she goes on to talk about like how so many of us are unloved and we're unloved as children. We were cared for, you know, um, but we weren't loved. We weren't, our, our parents, the adults in our life were not willing to expand themselves um, for our growth, our emotional growth. A lot of times I think um, parents will expand, stretch themselves to send their kids to school. Like, you know, I'm first generation um, Jamaican and there's a way that part of the immigrant Caribbean story is 
you know, work hard, abandon home, like do whatever you have to do so that your child can be, um, get an education, which is care and a lot of other things, but um, it's not necessarily love. It's not necessarily focusing the emotional growth of a child. And so I think I had to really like check myself around um, how I am in community with my own children and whether or not I am, like, how am I expanding? How am, and what I realized <laughs> when I like took a hard look, thank you for inviting me to do that, Carla. Um, when I decided to do that, I realized like, I am the problem. You know what I mean? Like I, I, how I engage with them, how I see them, how I talk to them. Um, I'm often really ready. I'm like, I'm always ready with a fiery email. Like when someone at school or in a play space, my, you know, especially like raising black queer children in this world, there's like always some, I don't know if we can curse, I curse a lot. Um, there's always some shit to contend with. You know what I'm saying? There's always something coming up and I'm really always ready to like, go in and fight these outside forces and what this you know this book this collective this this invited like asked me to do was to look at myself and recognize that like it's it's happening here in our home it's ha it's happening in the way i talk to them it's happening what i prioritize it's happening when i think about like every time you say something to a child around you know money and because I'm paying for things, I have all the agency. And I would say, wait a second, if my partner said that to me because he makes more funds, it, it would be a problem. You know, the way in which people are really okay with making fun of like children, you know, like, oh my gosh, like, to the, you know, I'm gonna knock that kid beside his head or I'm going to um, just like, just always like, just, it's okay for kids to be the butt of every joke. It's okay to talk about like how annoying teenagers are. Like that's just like a common thing we say, like teen those are people, those are human beings, you know what I mean? And like, if someone said that about, you know, my partner, any, like it would be a problem, but with kids, it's okay. Um, it's completely acceptable because why? they don't get to a say. And so we're constantly, and it's, it's so hard because I think that part of what is tricky in this cycle, and I, it often came up when I was running the free school and like, we're talking about how we engage with children and safety and all these things. There's a way that because we were all children, it doesn't make us more empathetic to children, it actually does this thing where it's like certain experiences are just a rite of passage. So I had this pain in my childhood. I had to go to school. I, you know, yeah, it, 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 we're, it's all, it's all, it's just part of what it is to become an adult. And really what our, what we're trying to do is just get everybody into adulthood. Like the work of parents, work of adults, all we're trying to do is like, how quickly can you become an adult? How every the more you um, the more you buy into adulthood, the more you uh, assimilate to adulthood, the more acceptable you are in our society, the more acceptable you are in the world, and that is our job. And I had this thought the other day. I was like, like we're the enemy. Like we're literally adults. Really, literally, what we're doing is trying to destroy childhood. <laughs> you know, like it's like literally our work is to end childhood we are our, our primary thing we're doing is trying to walk children out like leave that behind and come over here with us even though it sucks over here it's it's a trap do not do it like it 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 sucks over here um and I um I just realized I just I just don't want to do it and so many i Part of what um, in doing Raising Rebels, the podcast um, that I do, what I wanted to talk about was how as, you know, progressive Black parents, we're often trying to fight the powers out there. And it was important that we recognize the ways we've internalized those same ideas about like what makes someone good, what makes someone worthy, what makes life worth, like all of those things that we've internalized that we, as part of how we're raising our children. Um, 
I, like I often think about, we focus so much on like the content. Like I want to make sure I'm teaching my child about, you know, what whose land we're sitting on. You know, like I want to make sure I'm teaching my child about like the transatlantic slave trade. I want to make sure I'm teaching my child about Mal and all of that is like well and good. Um, like teach them all the things, sure. Um, but more importantly, get out of the way. <laughs> you know, like more importantly recognize that like how you are teaching those things are more like I wouldn't even say as more oppressive more in alignment with like white supremacy than what you're teaching and so that's the stuff that I have constantly had to um rework and like like and it's like constant practice like every, I said to my I was talking to my partner today and I was like you know what I think we really need to do often is to ask our children if they think we have a favorite and I said and he's you know it was like that's interesting what do you think they'd say and I was like I don't even think it matters what they say I think that what's it matters but like that's not why we're doing it I think why we're doing it is like we need to be willing to hear the truth we need to be willing to hear and not be defensive around like oh, you said it was so-and-so. Well, that's not true. Look at how much I love you both the same. More to say like, oh no, this is information about where I'm fucking up. Like this is information for me around where the inequalities are existing within our home and so that I can do something about it. We have to, as parents, be willing to invite back feedback, like real feedback from our children and to recognize that that is really hard. Like children are so loyal to their parents. And I'm talking about like adults. <laughs> when I talk to adults on a podcast and they're telling their stories of childhood, there's always this desire to kind of like make it okay that my parents beat me, make it okay that they made, like I felt like lost or alone, make it okay that I had some kind of like, I don't want my parents to feel like I don't think they love me. And the, like, as adults, you know, this is the, so for children, this is also the case. So this, I think a lot of times, like we think we are getting that feedback from the children in our lives and we really aren't. Um, so I would say, you know, I could go on and on and please tell me if I'm rambling, but um, I think the role that vulnerability, you know, plays in all of this is that you've got to be, you've got to be like really brave really 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 brave to invite this level of introspection into your life like you have to be really brave to be the villain do you know what I mean you have to be really brave to and you know it's it's really hard to be the victim you know to be the targeted group it's really really hard um and when you are the targeted group to then turn around, like I'm speaking to specifically, you know, black, brown, queer parents to then turn around and be willing to say, and here I am doing the same shit to the people I love the most, the people I'm supposed to like be um, here to support, to like, to ride for, to like, the most that I am doing this. I think that's like really, it requires a lot of bravery because it is lonely, because um, it is heartbreaking. Like I said, I couldn't like, I, it's hard for me to I make, like even listening back to old episodes of my podcast, like it's cringy to me. I'm like, I can't believe I said that about my child. You know, like it is really hard. Um, and also it's adults, will make you, will ask you to become like co-conspirators with them in the oppression of your children every single day. Schools are asking you to do that every single day. Grandparents are asking you to do that. Partners are asking you to do that. Like constantly hover for me while I am like oppressing this human being. Like don't say anything. Don't um, like, don't check me, don't contradict me. You like, we have, you know, you talk like, we have to have this kind of shared um, perspective. And in order to oppress this very small young person, <laughs> it's absurd when you think about it, it's like so upsetting, so upsetting. And I wanna say like the last thing is like, we're trying to do something that we really don't know how to do.
right? There's no rule book. There's no precedent. There's no like, what do you mean like youth oppression? What do you mean like adult supremacy? That's just the way it's supposed, it is. No, that's not the way it is. That's not the way it is. That's not the way it has to be. That's not the way it should be. That's not the most loving way to be. And yeah, you're right. You still have to care for them. You're right. You're still responsible for feeding them. You're still responsible for loving them. You're still responsible for housing. All the things, all the things, because guess what? You have all of the power. You have all of the privilege. You do, the, the world is oriented towards you. I want to say one last, I mean, I want to say a lot of things on this call, but one last thing before I stop, we move on. Something that really pisses me off and like you can, the places where you can see adult supremacy at its like finest work is in TV and movies and media. And I am always like, I have been fortunate through my work to get to see children in spaces without adults, you know, like physically present. Adult, adultness is always in the room, you know, just like whiteness is always in the room and heteronormative is always in the room. It's always in the room. But I've been fortunate to see children function out with when adults are like not on them. And it's always amazing, <laughs> consistently. No one's fighting. No one's trying to like, well, like no one's trying to hurt anybody. Like that's not what it is. And anytime you see it in portrayed in the media, it's always like, oh my gosh, if you take the adults out of the picture, the children are going to just go like crazy. They're going to hurt each other and hurt themselves. It's like, what would they do? They would be fine. If we created spaces that were safe for them, they would be fine. Um, and I'm really like, fired up about this. I'm really fired up about this. Um, so yeah, <laughs> like, like I said, I will say more, but yeah. Thank you for the fire, Nolika. Mm -hmm, <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That was beautiful. Um, I just wanted to say every time I've read the book a lot, editing it, and uh, every time I read your essay, I would, I'd have to go have, cry for, literally cry for like 10 minutes. It's so it's so vulnerable and beautiful. And thank you for everything you do. Um, I'm not gonna, I do podcasts and I'm used to doing a big back and forth, but time we have, we have like this container with this event. Um, so I'm gonna move on to Zach. Mm. Um, uh, first of all, thanks for being here. Um, can you talk a bit about your experience growing up around adults um, who are aiming to center kids and their autonomy, not just at home, but like in a larger community, um, you were involved in a lot of uh, different intergenerational collectives, radical and not radical. Um, and just maybe speak to a bit about how that, what Nolka just said, that, um, adult, the adult supremacy is always in the room. Mm. Um, and, and maybe talk a bit about aging into adulthood. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Oh, I was going to mute us. <laughs> uh, yeah, first, thanks, Carla. And thanks, everyone, for having me here today. Um, uh, for those who don't know, I'm also 50% here to support Carla. Um, I've even been pulled all the way across the world to Prague to do this before. Uh, so, <laughs> you know, it's it's what I like to do. Um, so I don't want to take up too much space, um, but I appreciate that I got to experience uh, this kind of at least various attempts at creating youth autonomy throughout my life. Um, so I'd love to like speak on a little bit of that and share a bit of that. Um, growing up in a home where youth autonomy and confronting adult supremacy was centered was quite interesting because it was constantly a learning experience for like all of us from what I know and from what I saw. Um, like early on, I, you know, went to a school, but I think what was so important was that all of the movements into trying to center autonomy were always open. They were always conversational with Carla and Chris, my dad, where the process of them figuring out how to confront this was very transparent to me from a young age. It, so where they would maybe mess up by just whatever, be, you know, being young parents, um, I knew that it wasn't 
normal or that we should that we're working to making it better so it made me feel quite safe in my own skin and to make my own decisions um so when i moved into uh alternative education and then eventually unschooling pulling out of even an alternative school when i was around 13 i think it was really important that i had the autonomy to still exist in an urban space still have friends who went to high school and still kind of exist on my own terms without having to feel too isolated um, and a big part of this was the involvement i ended up having in various radical spaces be they theater groups for you know whatever or the purple thistle is the big one um and I think it, it was interesting being on a collective where there, the generations were quite wide because the broad definition of youth by the Canadian government at the time was about 15 to around 30. So I'm there, I'm 15 and I'm on this collective and I'm supposed to run a space and I'm given keys and I'm part of this kind of community. Um, but as much as kind of youth autonomy was centered in the space. Like Nolika said, adult supremacy is always in the room. It's always there. And in various forms, I always was confronted with little moments of uh, a, a power imbalance with some of the older youth on the collective. Um, but yeah, the one of the interesting things, though, uh, that ended up happening was having a younger brother who is 10 years younger than me as I was coming into adulthood allowed me to really see directly where I ended up taking on elements of adult supremacy, regardless of how I was raised, regardless of the environments I was in, just little moments even where my little brother will say something and my initial thought, the first brain worm is, oh, you'll figure that out when you're older. Just that alone is something I'm always having to check. And it is hard. It's really incredibly hard to check that stuff because the ego is involved. The feeling that you went through that, you regret that, you don't like yourself in the past, you're constantly growing and changing. So why should I listen to what someone who is seemingly in a position I was in before thinks? So yeah, it's a difficult thing to confront. Um, and I also noticed that I had to confront it a few times through the purple thistle as I got older, because I started taking on Kind of an educator role um, teaching dark room mostly photography and the like um yeah it, it's hard to really pinpoint anything specific where i felt um either autonomy or my own adult supremacy it was kind of a constant flow it was constantly in flux and constantly having to like look at myself, but also look at those around me. Um, it's, yeah, it's really hard to reflect on because it's my whole life. <laughs> um, it was, there was not really a moment where I had to make a decision, but that's also where I fall into patterns. So it's, it's kind of a, yeah, it's, it's a difficult thing to, to answer really. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm thankful that I've had the space since a young age to be aware of adult supremacy, to be aware of the need for youth autonomy, be aware of my own autonomy, and be aware of my own taking on adult supremacy because adult supremacy is always in the room. Um, yeah, I think that's everything. Thanks, Zach. That's great. Um, <laughs> uh, Stacy, hello. Thanks for being here. Um, your essay, I mean, it just has so many layers and it's, um, I think it's just really in deep, it's deeply important to bring forward and bring it, um, I don't want to say center it, but really bring it up to the front here. Um, and I, I'm just, your, your title says so much. Um, it's uh, for folks who haven't read it, who are on here, children of children, why the adult adultification thesis is a misguided trap for black children and families. Um, can you introduce these ideas and praxis to us here? 
So I first started thinking about this uh, when I was a doctoral student at Rutgers University doing my dissertation research, which then was called Why Black Children Can't Grow Up, the Construction of Racial Childhood in Jim Crow. And, um, and I was basically looking at how in the aftermath of uh, slavery and reconstruction, which uh, and the Jim Crow period, which overlapped with the progressive era, when you have this cultural ethos around improving the lives of children uh, through medical care, education, the establishment of a separate juvenile justice system, et cetera, et cetera, and how all of these different professions around children move through the race, uh, the, the language of race and racism. And, um, and then I was specifically looking at how the developmental milestones of childhood, embryonic development, birth, adolescence, puberty, um, got seized by white supremacists and used to justify discrimination, to justify lynching, to justify discriminatory policies. And all of that then seeped into black parenting a new generation of Black parenting that felt it needed to use um, harsh parenting to ensure the survival of their children. And this too was a continuation from centuries of, of slavery. So that's how I started thinking about that. And, um, and so for much of my activist life, I had explained that the harsh punishment experienced by Black children within their families has been in response to living in a racist you know, country that continues to deny um, our young access to the privileges and protections of the sacred space of childhood. I had been arguing that as a researcher, as a journalist, as a child advocate, as an anti, anti-spanking activist. And I consistently made this argument uh, in print media and broadcast outlets when there were huge controversies over corporal punishment, when there were police shootings of young Black people. I did it in keynote speeches, community gatherings, in workshops with social workers and parents and so on and so forth. And I, I went hard saying that the acceleration of Black children into perceived maturity has long been a hallmark of anti-Blackness in America. But then I met Toby Rolo and we started talking about all of this. And I realized that my dissertation was wrong, that what I had been arguing as a journalist, as an activist was wrong, not totally wrong, but it was wrong. I needed to reshape a lot of how I was thinking in terms of conceptions of childhood and conceptions of innocence and just the long history of anti-child violence. Um, I have not been alone in perpetuating this misguided thinking about the age compression of Black children and all of its insidious consequences. There's a lot of activists, um, political commentators, academics who've been producing reports like Girlhood Interrupted, for example. I think that they're out of Duke. Um, I think that's Duke. I hope I got that right. Um, and other policymakers who have advanced uh, this adultification bias thesis through uh, qualitative and quantitative studies on the experiences of Black children, and also surveying people's, you know, racial attitudes about children. Um, and so th there seems to be this collective agreement that there's a deliberate unwillingness to see Black youth uh, as children. Um, one popular explanation of, um, for the disproportionate violence with police violence against um, children is because of adultification bias, that Black boys and girls are not seen as children, they're seen as little as, as adults, and are denied, you know, the privileges and protections um, guaranteed to white children. Um, some people will point to the language that gets used to describe uh, young people, so like Tray Trayvon Martin, for example, in the closing arguments of George Zimmerman's case, George Zimmerman's attorney repeatedly referred to Trayvon Martin as a man, whereas the prosecutor in that case kept trying to return him to childhood by calling him a boy and reminding the, you know folks that this was a scared boy in his own neighborhood with Skittles and an iced tea. Um, and so, uh, and then Zimmerman's attorney drew from this long trove of, this old trove of racist um, ideas about 
black children's physiognomy. They even, he even bought out a card out, cardboard cutouts to show the different size between the size differential between Zimmerman and Trayvon. So that case was not just about whether George Zimmerman was guilty or innocent, but whether Trayvon Martin and millions of other black children actually qualify as children. And the outcome of that case scared black parents and even white parents who have biracial kids and have adopted um, black children. And so we really started seeing that conversation about the adultification of black children amping up after that case and continuing through the Black Lives um, um, Matter move, uh, movement. So there's this language about calling children women, men, there's comments on their size. Uh, the argument is that they're not black children are not seen as innocent. They're not afforded the ability to make mistakes or given the benefit of the doubt. Uh, and that adultification bias might be driving the severity of harsh punitive responses against black children uh, by teachers, judges, mental health providers, emergency room, um, you know, staff, law enforcement, and so on. So there's a they're they're arguing that there's a pr propensity to respond to young black people as if they're fully developed adults um, and not allowing them to make mistakes. And so that popular conception of what it means to be a child and who gets to be a child, people argue are structured against black children. That black children are pathologized as angry, disrespectful, sassy, deviant, threatening, criminal, sexually precocious, and they carry adult-like culpability. And, black and, and as such, Black children are denied empathy, compassion, nurture, nurturance, and opportunities to learn from their mistakes of like their white um, peers. My essay also goes into talking about how adultification bias asserts that childhood um, is a privileged and protected category, which is denied to Black youth because of racism, that only white youth are allowed to be children. Um, um, and so all of this is supposed to explain the denial of innocence and protection and the violence that we keep seeing perpetuated against uh, Black youth. But in my conversations with Toby, and we've been talking about this incessantly and obsessively for years, he helped me understand um, how the adultification thesis gets things backward because um, we all have been sort of deluged, inundated by these popular uh, representations of childhood as some kind of, you know, protected category that childhood innocence is like this real thing, um, rather than us stopping and saying, wait a minute, let's look at the actual histories and experiences of children. Let's go back, let's look at the art. Let's look and see what the archives were. Let's see where all those dead kids are buried in the walls of churches and buildings. Let's look at mass infanticide. Let's look at what preachers, you know, have said about children and childhood in their sermons. Let's look at the dark and ugly experience and brutal experiences of children um, throughout the history of the West. Uh, it's a dark and brutal story of slavery of mistreatment, sexualization, murder. Um, and, and so what happens is we have in our, in our conception this celebration of childhood innocence that we see in art and in culture that obscures, you know, this very dark, you know, ugly history um, uh, and how unsafe being a child has always been, you know, for kids. And so in, in those conversations, um, you know, I, I began to learn how to see how problematic, uh, I was resistant at first. You know, Toby will tell you, I pushed back a lot. I'm like, what do you mean? This is, you know, um, you know, black children aren't being treated the way that, that they're being treated because they're being denied innocence or people are not recognizing them as, as children. So I had put up a lot of resistance, but as I started listening and then going into the archives, um, you know, he really helped me see how problematic a lot of the studies were, looking at the methodological flaws and how they reinforce this idea that there's some general societal protection of children, which ultimately perpetuates 
a gross misunderstanding of white supremacy as some kind of child friendly thing for some children. And he helped me see that white supremacy requires the destruction of all children, regardless of race or ethnicity. It, it requires the destruction of kids psychologically, physically, spiritually, emotionally, so that they become susceptible to all kinds of toxic ideologies that will prime them to perpetuate all kinds of ideologies, racism, sexism, misogyny, homophobia, trade, all of those things that we're always talking about. Everybody's always talking about intersectionality, but they always skip over the foundational moment, which is childhood, where all this stuff begins to be perpetuated. And so um, I had to go back to Europe. I never thought that I would be writing about African-American childhood. So my next book is on the lynching of black children. And I didn't think that the story would begin in Europe. <laughs> I thought, okay, I'm going to the Jim Crow South and I'm looking for the first black child that was ever publicly hanged. And I'm gonna talk about all of these things that happened to black children. But no, I actually had to go back to Europe to discover that the first children who were lynched in history were white. My youngest victim is a six-year-old. I found one mass lynching of a public hanging of 10 white children. So white people had been doing this to their own children centuries before they did it to other people's kids. So what black children experience, this violence that we still see manifested today is part of a long heritage of anti-child violence that you know, was bought, it was one of those patterns that was bought over um, from Europe. And so I started reading about the history of white children's traumatic experiences in European cultures and how that abuse set the behavioral patterns of their descendants. So they carried that trauma over with them in their bodies um, and in their practices and how um, that the, the, so those patterns of their descendants would, who would then displace and project their unhealed trauma, rage, and barbarism um, onto people of color around the globe through colonization, enslavement, apartheid, indoctrination into a bastardized version of Christianity, and other forms of state violence that continue to evolve over time. And so once I started going deeper into the um, and to the archives, I began to see how whites modeled their treatment of black people on their own barbaric treatment of, of their own children, right? Um, so black people became, through colonization and enslavement became white people's new children. Um, and so they only partially rescued white children from some of that violence, it's less public um, because they, you need them to grow up to perpetuate whiteness. Um, white children get protected, not because they're respected as children, but because they're white. It's about preserving the future of whiteness. And so from this historical perspective, we see that black youth have never and are never being denied childhood. And that's hard. When I say this, particularly in, in black spaces, people like get real defensive about this. Like, what do you mean? Right. And I mean, it, it's and I have to be careful how I present this because there's so much that black parents and I don't have children. And so people are already resistant to me talking about parenting, you know, and so here I come with another layer of analysis, like all this stuff that you're trying to protect your kids from. It's not because they're being denied childhood, but rather that they are victims of the category of childhood itself, which has long existed as a space of exploitation and brutality. When we, can, we, we place childhood, conceptions of childhood, and we look at the evolutionary history of childhood, um, we, we understand that childhood has long existed as a space of exploitation and brutality. The same is true of Black people more generally. So age is a moot point. Dominant racist narratives have always infantilized Black people, referring to them as a child race and conceptualizing them as perpetual children. So black people get caught in a continuous limbo of childhood. They never escape it. Our bodies grow, we get bigger, we get old, right? But we never grow up. Um, 
So it's not a trivial fact for when black people are defined as children, it naturalizes and therefore justifies the cruelties of slavery, segregation, mass incarceration, and police brutality. So one of the first steps in decolonizing black parents, this is the last thing that my essay talks about is decolonizing black parenting, which means we have to understand the ways in which our, you know, people of color, especially, we have to understand how our conceptions of childhood our relationships and how we exist with our children were shaped by systems of oppression. And, um, and so, and how we've internalized some of those uh, very toxic ideas and behaviors like a corporal punishment, for example. Um, you know, so like a lot of black people will tell me that whipping children is a black thing. And I always say, no, actually beating your child is one of the whitest things you can do to destroy them. When you understand the history of corporal punishment, where it comes from, and how it got implanted into different um, cultures. And so one of the first steps that we need to consider in decolonizing black parenting is to reframe our understanding of the conception of childhood. Um, and that in pre-colonial cultures, we had our own conceptions of, that these different groups had their own conceptions of childhood, the way they talked about kids, the way they thought about them, the way they elevated them, the way they handled their bodies, so we need to really, those of us who are scholars, get back to try to understand how those pre-colonial peoples, you know, interacted with their own children. And it's hard in some cases because a lot of these cultures were, you weren't writing those things down, they were oral. Um, and so childhood in America and throughout the Western world has never been a protected category. It's a perennial site of violence. Um, and, and so we have to look at how for, you know, 2000 years, white people have used trauma through corporal punishment, toxic religiosity, treating children as property, exposing them to public terror to actualize and ensure the future of white supremacy. The fact is white supremacy, as I said before, requires the destruction of all children in myriad ways so that we can perpetuate these inequalities. So adultification, thanks to Mr. Rolo teaching me this, is actually protective because being an adult is a privileged position. The reason white youth are more protected is because they are treated like adults or what he calls, this is a term I had to learn, I'm always learning some new term with him, proto-citizens, proto-adults. Right? Did I get that right, Toby? Proto citizens. Um, and so they benefit from adultification. White children actually benefit from adultification. So when Black youth are targeted for violence, it is precisely because they are children. Um, um, and when Black adults are targeted for violence, it's because they are conceptualized also as children. Um, and so, um, so, that's basically what my um, my essay is about, and helping people understand that you know some of the protections that white children experience is beca not because they're respected as children, but because they are future citizens. They are the future of of whiteness. Um, in a white supremacist society, there can be no mature black adults. They are always children. And so black youth are considered the children of children. So they're doubly doomed by their categorization as biological children, as well as offspring of an in inferior race existing in a permanent condition of cultural infancy, lawlessness, criminality, all of this for whom coercive discipline and death are the only recourse. And I'll just close out by saying, you know, like having people think about this question, if infantilization already sets Black people up for violence and death, then adultification would have the opposite effect of undoing the infantilization and liberating Black people. If white supremacy is an, is, is an attempt to undo the view that Black people can be adults, that they can achieve full adult responsible citizenship, what then would be the, the point of adultifying young people? It seems like it's an unnecessary um, step. So I'd like people 
to think about that. And then I'll just close by saying that the, and I say this in, in my essay, that the adultification thesis is both a mistaken and counterproductive trap, as, as I say in my title, because it perpetuates the myth of protective childhood and it, it invites Black activists, researchers like myself, Black parents and communities to seek white protections for Black bodies. If anything, categorizing Black youth as children when all Black people are already considered and treated like perpetual children simply re recapitulates the violent logic of slavery that denies the protections of childhood. And Black children are not abused, discriminated, and killed because police and other vigilantes fail to recognize them as children. They're not experiencing some sort of reverse hallucination in their brains. They're killed because they are Black. They are and always have been a threat to the continuity of white supremacy. Black children have always been treated as enemy combatants in the same brutal manner as their elders. Whether they are considered children or adults is completely um, irrelevant. So us calling on this country, on the government, teachers, whomever, to say and recognize that our children are children you know, categorizing black children as children will never save them and protect them in a white supremacist society. So that's all I have to say. Well, that was a, that was a lot of incredible, um, I think you just put it, you put it out so beautifully and I really appreciate it. And uh, I'm sure a lot of folks listening are, are uh, having their minds blown a bit. Um, I look forward to seeing how it ripples. Thank you so much for all your work. Um, and I really love that Toby supported that because Toby has supported me a lot as well <laughs> and a lot of us. Um, um, I feel like I almost want like a space that was a lot. Um, check, do a little check in, is everyone doing okay um, on the panel? Okay, um, so Toby. Um, what does childing the world mean? Best title ever. Wanted it as the title of the book. <laughs> and why is it so vital for collective liberation and justice? And um, I mean, Stacey just spoke to this a bit, but can you uh, speak to some of the ways adult supremacy and childism, um, it, it began over in Europe? Uh, well, thank you, first of all. and. Uh, for putting together the volume, Carla. I think it's really excellent. And thanks to the speakers, Nolika and Stacy. Stacy's conveniently left out all of the things she taught me, uh, which is classic. But uh, so I'm going to be quick here because um, uh, my contribution is actually fairly simple and I'll try to get to your question, Carla. Um, uh, and I'll try and leave as much time as I can for, for the audience to uh, the folks who are with us still. And thanks to the audience for showing up too. It's nice to see that we have so many fellow travelers um, asking these same questions and concerned about these same sorts of things. So uh, I imagine childing to be something like a critical child center approach to issues of intergenerational justice similar to how like queering and cripping approaches have sought to like interrogate the unnoticed heteronormative and ableist assumptions that inform a lot of our cultural practices and institutions. And so childing, I imagine, is a, a way of looking at systems both historically and currently uh, in ways that try to reveal the, the, how those systems exclude, dominate and exploit the young. And so childing takes the child as its primary lens of analysis through which cultural beliefs and practices are evaluated. It's a critical approach because we're not assuming that the institutions uh, that children were, were that we're trying to include children into are innocent or even hospitable places for young people. By child-centered, I mean looking at institu how institutions treat the young because and for no other reason that they are young. Uh, so childing the world is a goal 
Uh, the goal is not to find ways to include or integrate or accommodate children into existing spaces created that have been historically created by adults for adults, but to explore what our practices and institutions would look like if children were genuinely part of the process of creating them or co-creating them rather. So for example, what would our economic or productive life look like if young people had a genuine say in how it was organized? And I'm pretty sure it wouldn't resemble anything like capitalism. Uh, capitalism actually can only exist so long as children are either working in the factories themselves or sequestered in schools all day so that parents are freed up to participate as laborers. So capitalism cannot exist without the subordination of children and sequestering and detention of children in particular institutions, or if they're working as well. Um, but it might not resemble socialism either. We don't really know because we have never actually involved the youth uh, in the um, formation of our economic or productive organization. So we could also ask what education would look like. And again, I don't think it would look like anything like state schooling. Um, more, most importantly, I think is, is the question of what collective decision-making or governor, governance or law would look like if, if youth were genuinely involved. And here again, I'm pretty sure it would not look anything like mass elections and political parties, sovereign states and borders. It probably look vastly different from those sorts of things. So Child in the World presents a kind of radical productive critique of existing systems in much the same way as uh, critical approaches exemplified, we see exemplified in critical race theory, queer theory, decolonial theory, uh, disability studies. Uh, the difference here is that the child is the starting point. And I think this is important for two reasons. I'll be very quick here. The first is that the fields of critique I just mentioned, the critical race theory, uh, critical disability theory, um, take up the very real and very important issue of children being oppressed because they're a particular kind of child. So a child of color, an indigenous youth, an LGBTQ plus youth, or a child with disabilities. So these are cru uh, crucial areas of critique and activism. But we also need an analysis, and we're sadly lacking an analysis of children's exclusion and domination because they are children. Related to this is the second reason I think a child-centered approach is vital, and Stacy's kind of already touched on this in depth, is because the very idea of childhood itself is a space of naturalized subordination to adults, and it provides a model and a framework for the subordination of countless other groups. So if it's right, for example, to keep children out of politics because they're inexperienced or irrational, then anyone we want to exclude uh, we can simply stereotype as lacking sufficient experience or rationality. We can label them as childish or childlike. And now we have a justifiable, legitimate form of exclusion we can apply to those people. So this is the logic behind the exclusion of people of color, as Stacey has pointed out, the child races. It's also the logic behind the treatment of indigenous peoples as wards of the state. It's the logic behind the exclusion of women who have been um, labeled as emotionally infantile or childishly irrational. It's the logic of excluding peoples with disabilities because they've not fulfilled the a human being's alleged natural trajectory from an, a child to an adult. So they remain in some way uh, a, per, a permanent and perpetual child. So it's important to challenge the model of childhood exclusion because so long as it remains, other people can be excluded on the grounds that they are like children. So I think this is really key because if we struggle for the equality inclusion of groups, arguing that they should not be treated like children as the first wave feminists did, arguing that they were just as capable as men of being mature and rational and should therefore have the same rights as men, then we actually preserve and reinforce the original logic of exclusion. So put another way, if our rallying cry is that we should be treated like adults, not children, then we are affirming that poor treatment is unavoidable and natural for children. And so long as we preserve that space of naturalized and normalized domination, we are um, all potentially ensnared in its logic, right? We can all find ourselves potentially labeled as childish or childlike and then subjected to the abuses deemed appropriate for a child. So childing the world, a child-centered critical lens of analysis is necessary to examine and transform not just the institutions we know are a source of harm to vulnerable peoples, 
states and capitalism, things like this, but also the way we sometimes unwittingly strengthen those institutions when we think we're actually challenging them. Thank you so much, Toby. That's, that's child the world, childing the world. <laughs> Great, is it all right to kind of come in with some uh, questions from the audience? All right, Absolutely. Awesome. we've gotten a ton of really excellent questions, some of which are responses to things that have already been said, some of which are whole new directions. We're not gonna be able to get to all of these questions and I'm sorry about that because I would love to, um, but we could just start right at the top. Somebody submitted a question about the relationship um, between uh, adultism and ageism or, or the, kind of the oppression of the young and the oppression of the old, um, and whether or not these two forms of oppression might have something in common or some relation to each other. Uh, and I'm not sure if anybody feels up for tackling that. Uh, it seemed like a, a really interesting question. I could say something about that. Um, so ageism is a real serious issue. Um, and uh, we are lucky to have recourse for people who are elderly. We have laws against the abuse of elders, right? We have um, institutions in place to help elders who are suffering from um, age-related, um, you know, degradations in intellectual, cognitive, and physical capacities and things like this. Um, so we're lucky actually to have recourse for ageism as directed towards uh, older people. Uh, so we should be fortunate, we should be thankful for that. Unfortunately, in uh, a large number of Western countries, we do not have the same protections for children. So it's illegal to hit old people. It is not illegal to hit children. Um, it is not illegal to sequester children, to detain children, to force children to do any number of things with their bodies. Um, there is absolutely no legal recourse unless you basically leave a bruise on a child uh, to follow up and to protect children. So while ageism is a very important and serious issue, and it is related to um, adult supremacy, um, there are at least protections that we still need to fortify for older folks. There's a much larger and much more um, a, a much more distance to go when it comes to protecting uh, young people. Yeah, and just to, just to piggyback on what Toby was saying, because I do a lot of work on corporal punishment, it is codified in law in every single state um, uh, determining, defining how you can appropriately strike a child's body. Um, so you can hit a child one way in Texas and it's okay. Do the same thing in Vermont. You, you might go to jail. Um, there are 19 states which still allow paddling of public school uh, children. Most of those are in the South. The top 10 paddling states are also once were the top 10 uh, lynching states. Um, Every state with the exception of New Jersey and Iowa allows uh, corporal punishment of children in private and charter schools. We don't know how widespread uh, the issue is because those schools don't have to report their numbers to the Office of Civil Rights. Um, so this is a question of bodily integrity. So once you reach adulthood and move along the age spectrum to being an elderly person, you still have the right to bodily autonomy uh, in ways that children um, actually don't. Um, children don't have to, we don't need children's consent to touch their bodies in this way. They can't mm -hmm. say no to a, a school teacher or a principal or a parent. Um, it's illegal to hit adults, even a dog, <laughs> but for kids, it's sort of uh, defined mm -hmm. as for their own good. Mm -hmm. Can I add something really quickly too? I um we have to be mindful how we keep centering ourselves as adults. And I think like this question and well-intentioned, I think about it often, it would come like it comes up, right? 
that's somewhere as it, we have to just be like critically constantly practicing decent, like not centering ourselves in these conversations. And part of that is like, yeah, we're all going to go into old age, you know what I mean? And trying to figure, my grandmother would always say, once a, once a man, twice a child, it's like the same, you know, this kind of thing. And in our language and everything, I just want to kind of just like put that out there as part of what is, what also happens for us is like, well, what, what, as an adult, how am I still the victim or how am I going to still be victimized in the future? And like, that's not the problem. <laughs> I mean, like that's, we have to own our power. We have, if we do not recognize that we have all the power in the situation, we can that not create the change, right? Like it's good, it's someone else is gonna do it. It's happening to us too. I kind of just wanted to add that a little bit to the mm -hmm. conversation. Thanks y'all, those are great answers. Um, another question um, that was submitted uh, in the Q and A, which I think is a great one, um, given everything that has been shared tonight, is uh, just a question of practically um, what we can be doing uh, in our daily lives uh, to confront adult supremacy. And I realize this is this is like the the infamous like, all right, we've learned that everything is rotten. Mm -hmm. Tell us what to do now. Um, <laughs> but, but I think it is an important question. Also, yeah. is like what are some practical things that people who work with or share homes with young people um, with children can be doing uh, to actualize this? Ask kids. Uh, yeah, yeah, I was going to say, yeah. listen. <laughs> yeah. I think, and I also want to say something like that came up, Carla, you mentioned it, and I have no idea, I'm not like in the chats, but like people talking about like, why aren't children part of this conversation? Or like, how do you bring kids in? Recognize that spaces that are populated by adults are not safe for children. Mm -hmm. And I mm -hmm. think like that is something you can immediately like do is just rec like being willing to look at like your environments and you know like what is the ratio of adult to child in any yeah. type of thing being able to look at the segregation that we all propagate like how mm -hmm. we all you know my kids are always mad when adults come over because there's like this way that they just want to section off like they want to be and, like they're like if you saw, when you see that happening around gender, it's problematic. When you see it happening around race, it's problematic. It's also problematic when you see it happening around children and, uh, and like adults. I think um, this is my, this is my wheelhouse, the practicality thing I want to say. This is like, this is like what, like what to do. Let me tell you some things you can be doing. Um, I think the other thing you can do what any um, dominant group can do the, like really the only thing you can do is provide cover, provide cover. Mm -hmm. And like in practical ways, that looks like when your child's like, I don't feel like going to school today, call the school and tell them they're sick. Yeah. You know, when your child's like, you know, I'm uncomfortable going to like, I don't really feel like being around that aunt or that family member. Don't go to, don't go to the dinner, like provide fucking cover. That's what our job is. Like, and if you want to see models of how to do it, like look to you know i'm an emergent strategy like something that i'm really into and like i consider myself emergent strategist look to like the animals you know what i'm saying like look like what all is happening and how you know animals care for their young and are you doing that you know just give and only give don't expect anything back they're not giving you anything back they don't need to <laughs> you know what i mean um and I think like those are things I'm really excited. I am too with the podcast, like wanting to engage with people who are not parents around this conversation because we are all parenting children. We are all mm -hmm. engaging with children. We are all part of this, um, this, what is happening. And I think that is the part. And I will say the other, like, I mean, I can go on and on and on. <laughs> I would say, be honest about your childhood experience. Like, be honest about how you were, like, how you experienced childhood so you could recognize how that is impacting how you engage with children now. If you mm -hmm. were told and did not like, like, I always say, like, my kids are always like, why, why do adults hate teenagers so much? Why did, like, what did teenagers ever do to adults? And I was like, because they didn't like themselves as teenagers. Mm -hmm. You know, by the and part of the reason they didn't like themselves as teenagers, I think I didn't study this. I, you know, that's not my my. I'm not academic, but is because of that adultification, like that that you know. I do think of this as like a spectrum, right? Like any other 
kind of identity. And when you hit adolescence and you have to decide, am I going to abandon childhood or am I going to move into adulthood? And what conflicts that brings up for you and how you engage with other, it, it's a it's messy business. It's messy business. And I think there has to be some feeling around like how we betrayed ourselves during those times that kind of continue to um, fester in how we engage with children, you know, and how we engage with adolescents. And so, um, yeah, I'll go, I'll stop. But <laughs> if you want more, the podcast is there. And that's key. <laughs> Uh, yeah I think that we also need to put like you know there's a lot of people who are trying to do be (laughs) anti-racist you know and they try to speak up when they see racism hear it in their own families in social media spaces yada 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 there are even groups like you can tag the white nonsense roundup people if somebody comes on your thread and they're saying these sorts of things um I think we need to have a similar approach to calling out childism and, you know, these everyday prejudices when we see them um, articulated against children. Um, I do it on social media all the time. So when I see videos of children being shamed um, by parents, when people are sticking video cameras in their faces, watching children have meltdowns, and I'm like, well, how would you like it if somebody did that? You know, I'm always that mm-hmm. nag there who's just destroying everybody's joy and pleasure <laughs> around the suffering and shame of children. Um, you know, calling out language, mm-hmm. like when people are like, Donald Trump is so childish. And I'm like, stop slandering children. Like you're mm-hmm. using that word childish. You know, you're basically saying that there's something wrong with, with you know, um, children you know, their natural way of being. No, Donald Trump is a a whole different mess of pathos that has nothing to do with childhood. Well, maybe his own distorted childhood and trauma that he experienced at the hands of his, you know, degenerate family members, but that's a whole nother, his niece wrote a book about, y'all just read her book, she'll tell you. Um, (laughs) um, But it's like calling this stuff out when you see it, you know, like, if I see somebody hitting a child in public, I call it out. I respond the same way if I would see a man slapping a woman around or vice mm-hmm. versa. I'm not gonna say, oh, I just need to mind my business because that's mm-hmm. a child. I'm not gonna call mm-hmm. the cops because that's a child. You know, the, it's just perpetuating, you mm-hmm. know, that exclusion, all this exclusive stuff that we've been talking about. Mm-hmm. So I just find ways and then checking your own self, like your own ideas um, about children, how you view them. Like me, when I see kids, I always feel like an anthropologist or a child psychologist. I just sit back and I stare and I study and I'm like, I wonder why they're doing that. And I almost want to get on the floor with them and try to like crawl with them or just just follow them around to see where this is going to take them, right? Mm -hmm. What journey journey are we going to go on? Instead of like many of the adults in the room who are like, "Mm, that child needs to be beaten or these kids today are horrible, you know, um, and, and, and just checking people's analysis around kids. So one quick example. So one guy on social media was telling me, so I was talking about, you know, the harms that hitting children has on their brain development and so on and so forth. And so he was like, see, it's this kind of thinking that has got these kids today killing their parents. And I said, oh, I'm going to have fun with this one. <laughs> um, you've fallen into my trap. And so I pulled FBI data or on parasite, which is children killing parents. It's very rare. It's like less than 0.4% of all homicides are parents of kids killing their parents. And something like 90% of those murderers murders are done by adults killing their parents, not Mm -hmm. actual children. So, you know, I had to screenshot the chart and everything. So when we call out this stuff, we also have to traffic in data. We have to traffic, if you're talking about psychological harms, physical harms in the science, what does the science say? And be fearless about clapping back against religious ideas, these very toxic religious ideas about children you know, I, and I'll, I'll go as so, so far as to say, well, why would I take advice from somebody 
who, you know, ordered children to be drowned, sacrificed on altars, you know, set his own son up to be lynched <laughs> to save us all, you know, just depending on my mood. The goal for me is about centering kids and being a voice to advocate for them. Because if we don't do this, and there's so few of us doing this, these toxic ideas abound. And because we don't have laws in place to protect kids, all of this conversation in these digital spaces, the preaching, the joking, the videos, all of this naturalizes and normalizes this violence against kids, which produces more generations of traumatized people who grow up to keep perpetuating all of this. Thank you. I have a lot to say, but I'm, I'm noticing the time. Um, you can check out me and my uh, teens podcast called Grounded Futures, where he, he talks about this a lot, about he does. He does. dealing with uh, uh, how adults can show up um, really, really well and trust and believe. And um, yeah, I think we could move on to another question. Okay, yeah, we may only have time for one more question. Okay. Um, and there's still a bunch of really good ones. Um, I can pull one or if anybody else is looking at the Q&A and saw something that they really wanted to make sure we addressed, definitely jump in right now. Because otherwise, I think we're going to run out of time for it. <laughs> um, so a juicy one that has come up um, is the question of to what extent uh, like the institution of the family is actually sort of implicated in all of this. Um, and I guess, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I, I think, you know, the, the person who asked did not say the nuclear family, um, but certainly the nuclear family is in the mix. Uh, so I would love to hear what y'all think about um, how the idea of the family is sort of a perpetuating uh, okay. force uh, behind adultism. Oh my God, I want to hear from everybody, but I first want to say that um, we need more family, we need more kin, we need more expansion of what it means, what it looks like. I'm not really into the whole abolish family. I'm into abolishing or decentering the nuclear family, decentering it. Um, but no, we need more making kin, more than ever, of what it means to like be in uh, kinship together. Um, so I just wanted to really start from that place. However, you know, and then I think Toby has actually taught me a lot about um, the kind of, they go together, the kind of the formation of the nuclear family with this childism stuff. There's like, I think an intersection in history, but maybe you could speak to. Uh, yeah, I, I'm, I'm with you, Carla. Mm -hmm. I, like, I think we need bigger, bigger and great greater families with more more kids running around and everybody just being okay with it mm -hmm. and um uh, the nuclear family i mean it, it's a it's an outgrowth of a particular way of looking at children um and it's got a long history and so it's got its problems but i i, I can't um if some people choose it that i i'm I, you know mm -hmm. it's fine um as an institution Capitalism loves it, but so it's got its problems. But mm -hmm. yeah. I agree with Carla. I, I want to, I mean, I, I want to, some, I've had this thought recently, um, thinking a lot about this idea of chosen family and, you know, nuclear family and how people pull away from um, extended family and what all that looks like. And I think that sometimes it's like a question to ask, like, why does that happen? And I do think that when you are trying to walk this line or like trying to move away from adult supremacy, it becomes really hard to be around other adults, whether they're your family, chosen fam, like whoever the heck these people are. And I think in that centering of, of, of you know, child, I, I mean, I love this childing idea, by the way, Toby, I'm really into it. Um, and I think that as you are thinking about the child, childing of, of anything, there's a desire to have this like romanticized, like, oh, we could all be running through, the, you know, everybody's taking the village and we're all taking care of the kids. And it is really hard to find people, adults, who are willing to give up their power and be in community with children. Mm -hmm. I mean, we may be like, <laughs> you know, I, don't, I don't know the percentages, but the alienation that comes with what you're like, 
what you're talking about and like holding people accountable for how they talk to children, how social media, another thing Mm -hmm. some people can do is like really examine how you are sharing your children on social media. What are you saying about them? Yep. Mm -hmm. I tell my friends this all the time. People, everybody knows this. Like I don't like being around people, children, people and their children. Like it is cringy for me. I think that it's probably cringy for other people to be around me and my children for (laughs) different reasons. But I think it, and part of it is like, I could really love these people and really love their children, but how we have been conditioned to think about children is really hard. It's like, it's really hard for me to talk, to be around people who who think about gender in a particular way. Like, it's really hard Mm -hmm. to constantly have to like queer it. Like, you know, like it's here, people just like have these binary ways of thinking about things. And so um, I don't know if this speaks to the family question, but I do think that part of family is both a place can be a place of healing and it can also be a place of intense Mm -hmm. like trauma and intense like oppression and so there is a role to play but you got to be like really ready for that and that Mm -hmm. and it looks like again cover (laughs) you know it looks like who is willing to come in here and be the bound like cover these 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 people who are really like I mean, I say all the time, like all these issues, all these problems, everything that's going wrong, global warming, you know, climate change, the politics, children can fix all the shit real quick, real, real, real quick, if we allowed that to be how we move through the world. And I think we're just not willing to give up our power in order to, to let that happen. Um, so, yeah. And just real quickly to piggyback off of uh, Nicole, um, Nolika. Nolika. <laughs> Nolika, it's me. Yeah. I'm a stutterer sometimes, so things don't no. always come out smoothly. Um, the best group of kids to ask this question to are adoptees and foster kids. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm, a, a, I'm an adoptee and a former foster kid. And growing up with my brothers and sisters in the system, you know, and having our biological families or you know foster families mistreat us sometimes we had to develop a different understanding of family Mm -hmm. and sometimes we formed family with each other there weren't no adults in the picture right we we confided in each other we protected each other we looked out some were in gangs some formed families you know sort of fictive kin within confinement juvenile justice systems foster care systems And, you know, for me, it was boarding school to escape foster care. But then I became this young adult who was out in the world having my sense of identity not really intact because I was still holding on to these socialized conceptions of what a normal, healthy family was supposed to be for me. And because I didn't have that as a young person, I was walking around lost and full of grief and feeling like there was something wrong with me because I didn't have that socially constructed idea of what family was right Mm -hmm. and so as I got therapy and I've created this village I have like all these village mamas and daddies that I chose who loved and nurtured me and you know brought me back to health and thrivance I had to reconceptualize family and I learned that sometimes family well there's a huge difference between relatives and family huge Mm -hmm. difference Mm -hmm. right And sometimes the best and only gift that your parents can give you is to be the vessel to get you onto this earth to fulfill whatever ancestral mandate that you're supposed to be fulfilling. And so I think this is a question, this, 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 you know, we we need to integrate youth voices on, you know, in, in this discussion to help us see how they perceive family and how it's changed because we now are in an era where there's a little bit more acceptance of non-traditional, you know, family structures and so on. And so we've got at least a generation of young people, some young people who've grown up in, um, you know, different family settings. And we need to hear more about their experiences and and what what family means to them altogether. Thank you so much, Stacey. I also want to say, like, I abolished my own family because of the abuse Mm -hmm. of home and to take cover over my kin. Um, so there is yeah it's yeah. not a it's not a binary that's always complicated mm-hmm. 
Well, y'all, this has been just an incredibly rich conversation. And for folks who haven't already picked up the book, I will say that this is the tip of the iceberg in terms of all the like brilliant and inspiring content um, in uh, Trust Kids. So definitely do pick up the book, but also find all of these folks, all these panelists, follow them, listen to their podcasts, buy their books, um, because there's so much more to this conversation. And I really wish that this was like, part one of 10, uh, but, but unfortunately our time tonight has come to an end. So thank you so much to everybody who joined in. I really enjoyed this and I know um, all of our guests did as well. So have a great, great. evening. Thank you everyone.